Y'all, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about my Choice Act and to talk about an issue to me that is really about freedom. You know, the power of choice to me in education is truly the power of freedom. I think to myself when I go to church on Sundays, uh, a friend of mine, a guy named Scott and his beautiful wife, have a beautiful little girl. and She was born with uh, Down syndrome. And when I see them at church on Sundays, I often think to myself about what we're doing in the education space to make sure that every person has the opportunity to maximize their potential. And then I read a story about a little girl named Rachel Lewis. And I connected the dots to my friend Scott and little Rachel Lewis. Rachel Lewis also was born with Down syndrome. And her parents fought to get her into the right school and they successfully were able to get her in school and she did well, but then they had to move. And when they moved, the new school system simply was not very welcoming to Rachel. And so her parents fought for a year to give Rachel the same mainstream opportunity we want for every kid. And unfortunately, they had to fight and fight and fight. A little over a year later, they were able to get Rachel back in a mainstream classroom. Unfortunately, what they realized along the way was that they were going to now ask the system that fought to keep her out of these mainstream classes to now educate little Rachel. That's a tall order. That's a tough task. And so they decided to send Rachel to a different school, a school called Hidden Treasure, where Rachel could realize her potential. Now, Rachel's about 20 years old. Uh, she's graduated from high school. She doesn't have a job. She has two jobs. And I look around my church, and I, and I see my friends, and I say to myself, perhaps the Choice Act will be the path to seeing more kids realize more of their potential. I certainly believe that it's true here in D.C. as well, as I think through the opportunity component of the, the Choice Act, creating hope and opportunity for individuals uh, and communities through education. I think about the, the dismal numbers here in the D.C. area. So many kids trapped in failing schools, trying to find a way out. As a matter of fact, they're trying so hard that there are 20, one, 22,000 students on waiting lists. 15 schools closed. And yet, with a graduation of 56%, there is some conflict, some some challenge to the notion that we should provide more opportunity scholarships to more kids. Let me explain how that works. So if you, if you're, uh, how many of you guys would like to have better, better outcomes for less money? Please raise your hand. If, uh, I think it's, that, thank you, Mike, glad to see your hand in the air as well. Now, would you rather pay $20,000 for a 56% high school graduation rate, or if I gave you door number two, would you choose uh, $8,500 for a 97% graduation rate. How many of y'all would go with the 97%? Let me just think. I know I'm not supposed to leave the mic, but I just wanted to make sure everybody's okay. Right? Where, where are you from, sir? Well, that's what this is. Your hand's not in the air. I'll come back to you in a little bit. And that is the difference here with the DC Opportunity Scholarship. We're talking about the 6,000 kids over the last 10 years who've finished school here in the DC area have a 97% graduation rate. But more importantly, 91% of those students go on to a two-year or a four-year college. If, in fact, choice, the power of choice, is the power of freedom, we ought to take a serious look at the outcome of education right here as a, at a place where we could have a, a true challenge, $20,000 for 56% of the kids to be able to go on to a two-year or four-year education, or $8,500 where the kid 97 out of 100 times graduates, 91 out of 100 times goes on to get a two-year or four-year education, and 94 out of 100 times the parents are completely satisfied with their education. These are remarkable numbers. I will tell you, as I close here, that as a kid growing up, 
who did not do well in school. I, I think my story's been told a couple times, but just to refresh your memory. I was that kid. You see, 98% of those kids, Kit Kat, they come from underperforming schools. Too many of those kids, 86% of the kids are African American, 14% are Hispanic. Too often we write off these kids as at-risk kids that will never perform. I would rather seeing the results of the 6,000 kids that have gone through the Opportunity Scholarship, I would rather call the kids high potential children with a great future, an amazing platform, and paths that are filled with prosperity because we know that if you look at the results of education, we can see the results of employment. And let me finalize with this. As we study the numbers, and we have this great debate on issues over the next at least nine or 10 months before an election, I'd like for us to have that debate even after the election. If our other side would like to participate, I'll show up anywhere, anytime, any day to have that debate. Because what we're talking about is the quality of life that Americans will experience for a very long time to come. And so if you have a college education, your unemployment rate is under 4% today. If you graduate from high school, it's around 7.7%. For those who do not graduate from high school, which in my county back at home in South Carolina, 56% of African American males aren't finishing high school. The unemployment rate is 10%. But here's, here's where the rubber meets the road. After age 25, those who have not graduated from high school, only 50% of them are actually in the labor force. So think about that 10% unemployment rate compounded by the fact that only half are in the workforce. If we want to have a serious debate about people, let's have a debate about the foundation on which they stand. Let's have a serious debate, not about how to make more Republicans or make more Democrats or have a political conversation. I want to have a conversation about the future of a, of a country and it's based on our education. And to the extent that we provide equal access to the best education system in the world, spending over $600 billion collectively with the states, we can have a serious conversation about prosperity. And I hope that we have that debate for a lot longer than a year. And I will tell you that having had the privilege of a life that was going down the wrong direction, have you ever noticed that you always drift in the wrong direction? All drifting does not go in the right direction. I, I tried it. I'll just tell you that the results of drifting is bad. The, the, the results of focus is good. And I look forward to having an opportunity to talk about the issue of education further with the brilliant panelists that will accompany me. God bless you. Thank you.